Hello everyone and welcome to a new spin-off lecture in the topic of Manistee Elevation at Kipkai Syndrome and today we are speaking about the famous villain syndrome. Today we are going to learn how to diagnose villain syndrome and what is its clinical significance. And of course it is very famous for most of you, but we need to explain it in detail in order to be oriented to this way. First of all, we remember from the lecture of ECG Manistee Elevation at Kipkai Syndrome that we divided the abnormal T-wave into the T-wave inversion by basic T-wave and the hyperactive T-wave and the T-wave inversion can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Of course, we mentioned that hyperactive T-wave which is more than two-thirds of the complex amplitude in the time we think of STEMI. In case of asymmetric tube inversion, it usually achieves a strain pattern with structure or disease like in case of LDH or cardiomyopathies. But here we are focusing on two abnormalities in the non C, which are the biphasic T wave and the symmetrical T wave inversion. First of all, in the 2020 guidelines for non C elevations, they put criteria for isolated T wave inversion, which is more than one millimeter inversion in five or more leads, considering lead one, two, PBO, and from B2 to B6. So just inversion of more than one millimeter is enough to diagnose non C elevation and can prior syndrome. And as we mentioned, we have two types of T-wave inversion, which are the symmetrical T-wave inversion and asymmetrical. Asymmetrical morphology is the normal morphology for T-wave, whether it is upright or inverted. And of course, when the T-wave is inverted and asymmetrical at the time, it suggests a strain pattern, whereas the symmetrical T-wave inversion is suggestive of myocardial ischemia, and this is what we are focusing on today. And it's considered to be deep if more than 5 mm. So 1 mm is a cut point to diagnose inverted T wave and 5 mm to mention that they are deep. So in this ECG, for example, if this patient is presented, for example, with chest pain at rest, his ECG show evidence of symmetrical T wave inversion, starting from B1 at shallow T wave inversion and then they are deep from B2 till B6. And so we are having here the villain sign, or we can call it the villain syndrome, because of the deep symmetrical T wave inversion recorded lead most prominent of course in B3, B4 and B5 here. In valence syndrome we usually see isoelectric or minimally elevated systemic less than one millimeter so it is not categorized as a STEMI. But we can see by phasic T wave mostly in B2, B3 and may occasionally appear in B1, B4, which we call valence syndrome 5A, occurring in about 25% of the cases, and maybe deep more than five millimeter symmetrical tube inversion. B2 and B3 are the most prominent reported lead, but it may appear in B1, 4, 5, and B6. And this is called Bellet syndrome type B, which occurs in the majority of cases up to 75%. So we have two types. Type A is a biphasic T wave, and type B is a deep symmetrical T wave inversion. We need to understand the etymology of Bellet syndrome, or the origin of this name. It was first described by this one villains and their colleagues in 1982 in a subgroup of patients with unstable angina appearing in about 80-18% of the patients in their study. And they noted that 75% of those patients with the symmetrical or spiritual T wave, especially those with the deep symmetrical tube inversion, develop anterior wall and eye within weeks if they were just treated with a medical treatment. And that's why they raised the flag that this patient are critical and they would need urgent revascularization. Sometimes it's called Velen's syndrome as it is apostrophe S as a single name and has apostrophe S or as a plural name with apostrophe following the S. So in literature it would be written in three ways, either the first way which we have written in this lecture as a title or with the apostrophe S before or after the S. It is all the same. But the important thing is that it is pronounced as Velen, not Velen's syndrome, because it's Dutch name. And so it is V rather than W in the pronunciation, but it is written as W. It has another name, which is also a famous name in literature, but it seems complex, LED coronary T-wave syndrome. I think the syndrome, of course, is much easier to pronounce. The question is, what does it signify? Why it is important to describe this ECG abnormality with a name as Villain syndrome? and that 75% of those patients develop anterior wall and eye within weeks if they are just treated with conservative treatment. Signify approximately the occlusion or severe stenosis in about 99% of the patients. So it is correlated with this finding in 99 or up to 100 in some literature with approximately the occlusion. 
This means that this patient is critical and he's having a critical anatomy, even if he is just pain free. That's why it is very important to detect Bellis syndrome in the ECG. So, for example, here I would expect that I would have a data client for this patient, I would see subtotal or even total occlusion of the L8. So, let's see this ECG example here. We are having here an evidence of sinus rhythm and we have biphasic T wave from B1, 2, and 3 and slightly extending also to B4. So, we are speaking here about Bellin's syndrome type A. Let's see in this example, we are seeing here that we have T wave inversion in B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So, all the precorded leads are showing T wave inversion besides the inferior leads as well. This is not very, they are not very deep. But they are symmetrical to the inversion, so they are suggestive of Bellin syndrome 5B. And here, this symmetrical tube inversion also appears in the precordial lead. They are nearly approaching 5 mm. So are here also speaking about Bellin syndrome 5B. Here in this ECG example, we can see an evidence of deep symmetrical tube inversion, especially in lead V3, V4, and V5, as they are exceeding 5 mm. So here we are speaking about a classic example of Bellin syndrome type. So we have the ECG criteria of Bell syndrome of deep T wave inversion of biphasic T wave, especially in V2 and V3, but makes sense, of course, to the rest of the recorded lead, suggestive of critical proximal LED stenosis or even inclusion. But we need to mention the full criteria for Bell syndrome. First of all, history of angina and chest pain, of course, although the patient may be chest pain free at his presentation. This doesn't mean that the patient is stable and is not critical, nor is critical and better to be at the station or arrange for coronary angio and revascularization as soon as possible. But don't be astonished if the patient is chest pain free or he told you that just I have chest pain on exertion. Yes, he may present in a form of chronic chronic syndrome and sometimes he may present with non stimulation with chronic syndrome. The second one is the T wave changes, as we mentioned, the symmetrical T wave inversion or by the T waves. Minimal or no ST elevation. So, your ST segment can be isoelectric or minimally elevated less than 1 mm. That's why Villa syndrome is not considered STEMI, and I have put this lecture with the non ST elevation of chronic syndrome, and I'm going to mention with the chronic chronic syndrome as well. Normal R wave progression. There is no problem with R wave, and there are no pathological Q waves, as we mentioned here, because we are not speaking here about any crowdus, but we are speaking about critical coronary anatomy that need urgent revascularization. So it is important to recognize these criteria regarding the clinical presentation and the ACG criteria. Last thing is that the cardiac markers are normal or minimally elevated. So here the patient may have just unstable angina, he may have non semi or may have just chronic coronary syndrome without any evidence of myocardial injury. Then, is, of course, as we mentioned, if you notice that 75% of those patients develop a new wall MI within weeks if you are treated with conservative treatment. That's why we need to arrange for invasive chronic angio and revascularization as early as possible for those patients. Please don't discharge those patients and don't give them an elective chronic angio appointment. No, they need urgent chronic angio and revascularization appointment and better to be admitted if feasible. Bell syndrome, of course, can occur in this context. Bell syndrome, of course, can occur in the context of non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome or chronic coronary syndrome. In both cases, you will need to proceed to coronary angiography plus minus revascularization rather than invasive imaging. So, those patients should not be or should not have treadmill test or stress echo, myocardial perfusions, and no, just go for invasive coronary angiography after you perform the echo, of course. In non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, they should be admitted and never to discharge them. In chronic coronary syndrome, it's better to be admitted. And if it's not feasible, at least you need to arrange for coronary angiography and revascularization as early as possible. So, at the end of this lecture, we understood today how to diagnose villain syndrome and its clinical types, type A, type B, and what are the ATG and clinical criteria for villain syndrome. We understood also the clinical significance and the nearly 99 or up to 100% correlation of Bellin syndrome with LED critical stenosis or occlusion. And our take home message today, Bellin syndrome is a spot diagnosis in ECG that you should be alert in order to select this patient for invasive coronary angio and revascularization as early as possible without any intervening investigations. Thank you very much for watching.